great father and an awesome husband. That's Yolanda Phillip, wife of Jamal Phillip. Jamal is completely blind, but he is a force to be reckoned with. We met on Facebook. I sent him the friend request and then he accepted and then we start talking and one thing led to an ex. <laughs> what yeah. about him did you like? Everything. The family of three lives at the Lacolome housing scheme in Westerhall St. David. We caught up with Jamal at the St. George's Methodist School where he is teaching a visually impaired student to use the computer. Though he moves comfortably as a blind man, Jamal was born with sight. It's, it's um, a uh, dis disability that has been developed from a very young age due to the cause of um, retinal blastoma. That's a type of cancer in the retina of the eye. And um, unfortunately, because of that, they had to remove my both eyes and replace them with prosthetic ones. The reason for the removal is to stop the spread of the cancer so that it wouldn't reach to the body, which is where I'm alive today. So um, that was definitely necessary to save my life. How old were you? I was three at the time. Wow, that was mm -hmm. pretty young. Yes, it so was. So you do remember seeing things? No, not at all. You don't? No. Wow. I don't. How did you deal with being um, visually impaired? How did you deal with that from three years old? How did you handle it? Well, I don't know if I should say if I was fortunate because I have a mother who was, was and still is determined to get me where I'm at today. I was never the type of kid that would just sit there and don't do nothing. I, my mom always include me in stuff. As I always tell people, I started cooking my first pot when I was at the age of seven. And what pot was that? My first food I ever cooked at that time was pelau. Everybody! Everybody! <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was pelau. And um, <clears throat> I, I used to take care of my brothers at home when my mom head out to work. She used to be working in the hotels. I used to make the tea. I used to change the diapers. All at that very tender age growing up. So I have a lot of... age you say? From seven come up. So yeah. You, you were the oldest? I was the oldest. And still the oldest. <laughs> you, you say you're determined. Of course. Did did what people say affect you in any way, or how did you deal with that? Well, let me tell you, and that's just common knowledge. We are human beings. People would say things that would offend us one way or the other, right? Mm -hmm. it's, um, the most important thing about it is how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, people may say things from time to time that would have caused me to become offended, but I deal with it in a more, you know, intellectual and smart way rather than just bursting into flames mm -hmm. because I tend to feel sympathy for people who make statements that plain talk bad manners doesn't make sense <laughs> you know <laughs> because truth and in fact they don't know when they crucified Jesus on the cross you know he said father forgive them for they have known what they have done so it's just that's how I see it when people make statements or say things that you know probably may have an intent to deter me or cause me to feel offended. And I'm saying it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, be the case because as I said, we are human, but it's how you deal with it. You, you said you cooked your first part at seven, Palau. Mm -hmm. Why teaching? Why didn't you become a chef? <laughs> well, I mean, that really wasn't in my nature, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if it maybe picked up based on how I speak, but I, I, I like to lecture, I like to teach, I like to let people know where I'm coming from. You know, yeah, there are people, my, my deceased wife before, she used to say, man, just get to the point. You always have to say this before you say that and say that. But I say, but you know, I have to state 
every detail so I could be completely understood. So then when you just get to the point, the point you really get to the people. So. <laughs> wow, so then Malcolm X. <laughs> <laughs> so still, you say you deceased wife. Yes, I, I, I was married before. Mm -hmm. That lasted for five, six years. Okay. And unfortunately, she passed on due to um, ruptured appen appendix, Ooh. which was very unfortunate. Okay. And, um, well, I'm a Christian by faith, and I, I know that the Lord didn't want me to get back to my old ways. So he sent me a wife not too far off mm. after the whole ordeal. And um, not just a wife, but a full package. I get a kid and a wife, a new wife. So I have a new life. And wow. this marriage now is going on four years. <laughs> you're, you're determined, you're resilient, you're... What do you attribute that to? Well... I don't know, it's just the way I, 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 I perceive life to be. I just, you know, the type of person that think once you're alive, you can be who or whatever you want to be. And nothing should stop you from doing that. Because I know I would meet up other blind persons and trust me, I'm not making comparison, but I could really see them in a different light because they would be like, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that. And uh, they put themselves in a position where they just shut themselves off from the world. And I try to imagine myself being like that, and I say, "What? Well, no. Blindness, I mean, I don't, I, sometimes I question myself and say, I don't know, one of it's because I don't really remember what sight is like before. Maybe I am too comfortable in my zone or whatever. But um, <laughs> I just think that whenever stuff happens, as my mom used to always say, every disappointment is always for our good, so. Imogen Howard taught Jamal at both primary and secondary schools. When I met Jamal the first time, I looked at how he moved around the school, and I, it was an interesting um, situation because you're meeting somebody blind for the first time, they have the cane and they're moving around. And I can see at that time that he knew his surrounding, the, the children in the school well, were well aware of him and they interacted with him as, he, as though he's any other human being. Um, when I had the opportunity to work with him, at first I was a little bit nervous because I never had the experience or any training um, in dealing with someone who is blind. But the ministry had a program where they had an itinerant teacher, so I was comforted that I don't have to be afraid I would have this person coming in to assist in um, correcting his work or transcribing his work from the Braille to what we call English language so that I can correct it afterwards. And that continued also in the West Hall Secondary School where he attended there and he spent five years there. Um, Jamal used the recorder to tape most of his work obviously because he couldn't see to take the notes so his notebook were, notebooks were the recorder and he would play it over from time to time take his notes in Braille, and the itinerant teacher would come and transcribe it in the English language for us to correct and to ensure that he has the correct information in his notes. How would you describe him? Jamal, as a student, determined, hardworking. He had the trust to learn new things. He was eager. He wasn't a child that would not participate in things. He never allowed his inability to see to deter him from doing things. So when sports, he would want to participate and we'd have to put a rope so he can hold on to it to make a little run. He participated in the cross country route. We would have a group of students who would basically walk with him to give him the exposure. Uh, I remember when at West South Secondary School, he liked music and there was a DJ competition and he participated and he had placed second overall in, yes, in, um, with all the other secondary school children who were there. So that was a really good thing for him. It helped boost his confidence and so on. So he always was interested in participating in things. And what I remembered most is that Jamal was a force to reckon with. Despite he was blind, he was top of the class. 
And you'd find many times teachers would come and say, look, Jamal is blind and he's performing well. His average is this and he's coming in the first two. And you are there and you have your sight and you're playing the fool. Sometimes you'd find we'd have to say that because he performed in the first two from from one to from five. He was giving the children a competition. Yes, he was. And that was magnificent. He, he always studied. He looked for things to help him. I remember one time he was looking for a program to transfer the information easily into um, computer language so he could understand. And he found the program JAWS and he said, oh, look, there is this program JAWS that we can use to see if you can help me. So he always had that eagerness to learn new things. He loved computer science. He can fix things. Um, radio and so on. I remember we had one that wasn't working and we brought it to him and he fixed it. Ellis O'Gilvery is the acting principal at the Resource Center for the Blind where Jamal is a teacher. I, I thought he was um, really brilliant because I would have worked with blind and visually impaired persons before um, during my tenure in Jamaica and um, coming home to Grenada to meet a blind person functioning basically you say as good as some of the, the persons that I would have left in Jamaica where I thought the um, program was much better than what we would have had here. I was really surprised and really impressed with him. Okay, um, what would you say was responsible for his, for him being so such an outstanding person? Is it his own personality or the work done at the Resource Center? Uh, I think it's a combination of things. Um, his personality, his determination, um, the persons who would have worked with him would have helped him a lot. And most importantly for me, I think it's, it's the home background. Once you get that support from home, you go a long way. And he had that support behind him. Mm -hmm. Describe him as a teacher. Um, passionate. Um, what do I see? He loves what he does, you know, um, curious, always wants to find out. He is my go-to IT person. Jamal has benefited from inclusion in the school system here in Grenada. I think inclusion is necessary. Um, it is important. The, the persons who are included need the exposure. They need to be with the, the sighted peers. They need to be with the quote-unquote normal peers. Um, however, I think part of the challenge for us with inclusion has to do with um, the attitudes of some of the teachers in the, in the mainstream schools. And you'll find that most of the times parents get what, refer, what I would refer to as a, as a pushback rather than the, the welcoming open arms. And that to me sometimes could be a problem. But I, I believe as long as we can do um, the, the necessary education, of the teachers and so on, you'll find that once the attitude changes, I think it's gonna make a big difference in the way we, we, we see inclusion for persons who uh, have special needs, not just blind and visually impaired. Lolita Gibson is the acting principal at the St. George's Methodist School where Jamal teaches a student with visual impairment. How are the other students interacting with that one student? All right, well, that student came through the school from KG so basically the students are very familiar and um, they support him well, they interact with him well. I've never picked up any form of discrimination. They put out themselves to help him as a matter of fact. What kind of impairment does he have? Visual, yes. What does inclusion in your school mean to you? To me it is very significant. Um, as much as is possible, we try to ensure that that particular student is engaged, that he is involved in every activity that we have. Even if it means making special arrangements to have him accommodated, we do ensure that he is gainfully engaged. I believe in inclusion and I believe every child deserves a chance at success. And what do you say to other like uh, teachers and principal to encourage them to have an open mind to inclusion? My encouragement to them will be have an open mind. 
and see the child as a child and look beyond the disability and see how much you can get out of the child and see how much we can put into that child to ensure that that child becomes a, a functioning citizen. What do you say to someone who is new to a disability, whether it be a visual impairment, whatever it is, and they are not sure how to it, you know, you're missing out on life, life is a trial. What do you say to them? Life goes on. As long as whatever happens to you and you didn't die, it simply means that God have a plan for you. This production is part of a special needs sensitization program of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Program for Educational Advancement and Relevant Learning OECS Pearl. I am Sarana Mitchell reporting.